Kia ora and welcome to this edition of Tower Sector Report, delving into the state of the rural real estate market. Land prices are static despite the commodity boom and sales are slow. We find out the latest from the Real Estate Institute's rural spokesman, Peter MacDonald. Also, we talk to a top man who's been a driving force behind the Meat Industry Strategy Report, recently released. Meat Industry Association Chairman Bill Falconer's organisation spearheaded the strategy along with Beef and Lamb's Mike Peterson. What are the chances of real reform for the troubled meat industry? And Tower Sector Report correspondent Drew Chappell takes us deep inside the emerging world of agricultural recycling. Each year the country's farmers use more than 350,000 kilometres of feed wrap as well as thousands of tonnes of unused chemicals, containers and other non-biodegradable waste products. Drew shows us where it all ends up and how it gets there. But first, Bill Falconer of the Meat Industry Association, are we at last going to see meaningful reform? Well, Bill, welcome to Tower Sector Report here on Country 99 TV. Now, this is a pretty major report, although I suspect it's probably not the first over the years on, on uh, sorting the meat industry out. But you are dealing with a fragmented and highly competitive market. Did you, did you find you were having to bang a few heads together? Very interesting. A couple of years ago when the, mm. uh, the market was probably as bad as it's ever been, mm. and uh, both uh, Beef and Lamb, as it's now called, and um, MI uh, concluded that, that something had to be done to see if we could make the sector run better. And the response from both our membership, the Farmers for Beef and Lamb, the processors uh, for MIA, said, well, if we're going to do one more, uh, this time let's base it on some hard analysis. Uh, not just a description of the mm. of the problems, but let's actually lift the stones and see what the and and both of them said, and we will cooperate by giving you the data to help you do that analysis. Now that's just a uh, that's a turnaround in mm. our sector, which was hugely encouraging. Yeah, because it's uh, a traditionally fairly secretive, particularly on the processors side. Well, the processors are competitive bodies, mm. and obviously they do have to protect their competitive pr uh, position. But they said we will work on this uh, on this project to see what comes out of it. Mm. So what did you find when you lifted some of those stones that might have been a surprise to you? There weren't, there weren't that many surprises. Mm -hmm. uh, what mm -hmm. was interesting were the conclusions which were drawn out of the report. What can you do about this? Right. And uh, the idea that um, there could be um, greater cooperation amongst processors, for example, was um, uh, we, we've done this before, um, but uh, that was an interesting concept. I think the key uh, area of recommendation is this concept of aligned uh, procurement. I'll yeah. talk about that. I was going to ask you about that. Mm. And then, of course, um, uh, um, the report tells us how we could um, make more money now mm. just by adopting best practice. You know, there's things that all of us can yeah. do. Yeah. Well, um, you say there are three areas of mm. the industry which, which need to lift their game and increase mm. profitability. So let's just have a look at those three areas. Mm. First, um, in market coordination, which is a bit of a uh, mm. a bit of jargon, I guess. I'm just wondering if you can explain what yeah. you mean by that. It, it, this this is um, uh, more relevant to the new markets that um, are sitting there, waiting for New Zealand to uh, take on uh, China, mm -hmm. Indonesia, India. Huge markets, and the very scale of those markets, the very scale of the um, of the challenge, suggests that uh, it would make sense for companies to cooperate in taking those bigger markets on. Now they don't necessarily have to cooperate, <coughs> and indeed a lot of them would choose not to, in the in the marketing, you know, through to retail. But right. there's a lot of things they can do together. Um, you can have, um, you know, common port facilities, uh, common logistics, uh, common shipping programs. Mm. Uh, you well, you'd think, it's a no-brainer, they'd already have those sorts of commonalities and there, in you, place. Go. there yeah. you go there you go so that makes a lot of sense and of course we've got uh, a precedent with the North American lamb company mm -hmm. where a handful of companies just decided to get together and say look we're all doing the same thing why don't we do it together and, and save some money and have and have a bit of scale yeah. and uh, have a bit of economy about it mm -hmm. so that might uh, it might sound to you as though um, you know that's a no-brainer uh, mm -hmm. what took you so long mm -hmm. uh, but it was important to have um, the analysis done on which that conclusion uh, was based. Now, second on your list, and we <coughs> mentioned it before, is align, aligned procurement. Mm. A new piece of jargon to me. What do you mm. mean by that? Well, it, it addresses the, um, you know, what's called the Sunday night auction. Uh, 
Right. Uh, we're under the, uh, you know, for the last 127 years, is it, um, uh, lamb in particular has been sold on the spot market right. uh, by transactions which are facilitated by uh, stock buyers, as we say, you know, driving down the, the drive on a Sunday night and, mm. um, and everybody <coughs> bidding into uh, a, a thing which has got farmer competing against farmer right. to uh, pick up the um, uh, demand that the uh, uh, stock buyer has, uh, has identified. Mm. What this report looks to is a much closer relationship between processor exporter and farmer whereby the exporter says, look, I want uh, lambs of this size, this quality, but I need them in September. I'm looking for some early lambs. Right. Are you willing to contract now so that I can rely on that supply so, and so I can present them in the market, market? Or he says, my market wants some beef with these qualities, right. but it needs it at such and such a time. So farmers would then have to uh, say, well, uh, um, then I will have to make uh, change things in order to be able to meet that requirement. Mm. And the contract will be about you know, show me the money, uh, wh what are we going to do? But you get a much more aligned relationship where farmer and processor together mm. are saying, what can we do to make sure that the requirements of the market are met? Now, third on your list is sector best yeah. practice. What are you <coughs> talking about? What areas are you talking about which are not using best practice? Well, <coughs> it's interesting. If you have a look at the report uh, way back in the appendices there, you, there's a, uh, a thing which says that didn't get to the appendices, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't get to the appendices. Well, the thing there that shows that um, about 20% um, of farmers are hugely profitable, mm. you know, very satisfyingly profitable. And every farmer I've met is in that 20%, I should <laughs> say. Um, yes. But it tells you that um, uh, the others, there are things that they could do in order to um, uh, join that group. Mm. And um, there's quite a lot in the report about things that you can do as a farmer to change your game. Now, it doesn't right. come, uh, there's some investment involved in this. If you're going to have better forage or better feed or so forth, there's some investment. But there are precedents there to say that um, uh, best practice will give some early mm. returns. Mm. Mm. And same is true in processing. Yes, I'm yeah. sure it would be. And, uh, it you know, must apply to everybody's both very, um, uh, uh, you know, some plants do it one way, uh, others mm. another. Uh, there's best practice there which can, uh, right. can be pursued. Finally and very briefly, <laughs> let's talk about what goes on in people's heads. Now, mm. in your introduction to the report, you and Mike Peterson of Beef and Lamb talk about changing mindsets, attitudes, relationships. But how do you do that? Haven't we tr been trying to change people's mindsets in this industry for decades. Yeah, uh, that, that's true. And I, and I think it can only be done um, uh, by some <coughs> reasonably comprehensive um, uh, interchange, particularly with farmers, but also with processors. Mm. The end play here um, is one in which uh, farmers will get a, a couple of things. One is security of price. Mm -hmm in return for security of supply, uh, as opposed to <coughs> a peak spot market price, yeah. or indeed a, um, a spot market low. Mm. <coughs> if you think about dairy farming, the thing which is valuable there is the dairy farmer knows at the beginning of the season how much money he's gonna get, and mm. he can plan. Mm. Our guys don't. And so what we're looking for is a relationship um, <coughs> whereby sheep and beef farmers too can see a steady flow of income in, yeah. in response to a steady uh, supply of product, and they can plan. Well, I guess, I mean, it's really all about certainty and predictability. And of course, I guess, you know, as time goes by, we've got the old hands leaving the industry and perhaps a new uh, generation of managers on both sides, farming and processing, coming through, and we could see these changes in attitude. Well, Bill, very interesting stuff, and thanks very much for your time today. Been a pleasure. Bill Falconer, chairman of the Meat Industry Association there. We'll be back in a moment with an investigation into the growing agricultural recycling industry. Just what do we do with all that feed wrap and those leftover chemicals?
on the surface of things, most Kiwi farms are pretty neat and tidy places. Green rolling hills, contented animals and clear streams make up the popular vision of agricultural life. The reality is, of course, vastly removed from that ideal. As inputs on the farm like supplementary feed, fertilisers and disease controls increase, so too does the production of waste. This high input, high output system of farming is giving rise to a new breed of companies designed to reduce and reuse recyclable farming products. AgRecovery is a charitable trust supported by more than 50 of the country's largest rural services companies. It's one of the many players in an emerging industry, breaking new ground in the country which prides itself on being clean and green. Gareth Menser is AgRecovery's National Operations Manager and says the project reflects the need for give and take from our biggest agricultural companies. When the program started there were 12 brand owners. In the past four years we've had another 40 come on board, so we've got 52 participating brand owners now. So you know those brand owners are taking a, a position um, saying that the, the waste that's created as a byproduct of their um, chemicals and chemical containers needs to be recovered, so they participate in the program. AgRecovery operates nationwide, taking tens of thousands of tonnes in plastic and chemical waste, free of charge, from farmers everywhere. The company runs three main recycling programmes, the collection and processing of plastic silage wrap, agricultural chemicals and the containers they come in. It's recycling, but not as we know it. It's not like recycling, I mean, you're taking a product back, but it's that whole life cycle approach and engaging people right throughout the supply chain. So that's the manufacturers right through to the end user, and that's what AgRecovery is great at. You intertwine you know, 52 brand owners, users, and then processing requirements to make sure there's a program that's sustainable in the long term. And there's plenty of room for further expansion. The use of plastics and other non-biodegradable waste products on farm in New Zealand is increasing every single year. For instance, Kiwi farmers annually go through enough plastic silage wrap to go around the world eight times. It's numbers like these that has the international community seriously worried about agricultural recycling. The worldwide environmental standards for recycling are set by the ISO and were endorsed by more than 150 countries in 1996. The standards require participating countries to ensure primary production is sustainable and environmentally friendly. No easy task in a country as diverse as ours. Ag recovery seems to be ticking all the right boxes though, running the program according to Ministry of the Environment standards and drawing support from most major producers of the stuff they're collecting. The project, and indeed the growing sector of agricultural recycling, has also got the tick from the country's largest farming lobby group. The sign of a, a mature country is one that doesn't have plastic lying around everywhere. Philip York says the feds have long been concerned about the burning or burying of plastic sheeting, chemicals and other on-farm waste. Standard practice until recently. I think it's important that we do encourage people to recycle any plastic that they've got. The alternative is a burning or burying it and, uh, and as such we don't think that's particularly a safe, safe option but uh, I, th I think that uh, the schemes out there uh, that are, are particularly some that have been paid for be through, uh, through levies on the, the chemical manufacturers that uh, we should make full use of it. Instead of burning or burying their waste, Farmers can now take containers to one of AgRecovery's 70 designated drop-off sites around the country. From there, everything is inspected at least twice to ensure no chemical residue or sediment remains on the containers, which are then cleared for processing. AgRecovery's inspection team rarely encounters problems with the containers themselves, saying farmers learn fast. It takes a bit of time for them to get used to the, uh, the criteria, but it's important that um, the inspection side of it is, is, as I said, international best practice. That for us to operate in international markets, we have to have these programs. We have to have the inspection criteria. It's to safeguard the farmer as well as ourselves that we're not dealing with, for the containers program, we don't deal with the chemical residue. It is, it's purely the, the triple rinsed agrochemical container. And that's what we say with the containers, that it has to be triple rinsed when it comes in. 
Every year, the number of those farmers participating increases, and the job of processing gets bigger and bigger. So Gareth, how much, uh, how much plastic are we looking at here behind us? Behind us we've got about 2,000 kilos of shredded plastic, so that's been collected at various collection sites uh, around the North Island. Uh, represents, uh, in 20 litre equivalents, about 2,000 containers, but in actual fact you're probably looking at between three and 5,000 containers that are shredded. We'll shred anything between uh, one and 60 litres, as long as it meets our acceptance criteria. From this state, the former plastic containers will meet their fate inside Astron's processing plant in South Auckland. Gareth explains the various stages of that process. The process from, from this, uh, what happens to it in the next stage? Our driver shreds on site, so we shredded the material through a two-stage shredder. Um, it then um, turns up at, uh, at Astron, where we are now, and um, at that size. So Astron then take the plastic, they um, granulate it, so it's granulated, turns into a, a smaller size, and then they, uh, through their processes, um, extrude it, then melt, so then it's melted, turns into a, a resin, which is dyed black, and then that is turned into underground cable cover. So what starts out as a farmer's chemical container could well end up protecting our underground data cables. And of course that couldn't be reused in a consumer environment, could it? You've got agrochemical containers that, even after a triple rinsing process, will still have a potential chemical residue. The plastic does absorb some of the chemical, so the underground cable cover is away from human contact. It's uh, an end use that, as you've said, is in high demand and that uh, can continue to be used. The truck um, services the entire country, so it's based out of Hastings. He will uh, go down to the South Island now with the, uh, the increase in volume in the program. We'd be travelling the South Island for up to 10 to 12 days in a collection trip and that'll be servicing from Marlborough, our collection sites there, right down to the bottom of the South Island. And uh, we have collection sites from coast to coast. So now, with companies like Ag Recovery willing and able to process most agricultural waste, it's a fairly straightforward process for farmers to get involved. The common practice before there was something like Ag Recovery around for the collection of silage rep was to burn it or bury it. And that was, was common practice on farms. I mean, at the moment we have, um, we collected in our second year, 10 times the volume we collected in the first year. So that's just, a, I guess, a representation of the, the farmers' attitudes to, towards using the program. Currently we have enough bags in the marketplace to recycle half a million round bales. That represents only about 10% of the volume that's put out nationally. So, you know, there's still a long way to go, but that indicates, you know, the, the increasing volumes, the attitudes of farmers to participate are certainly growing. While Ag Recovery is by no means the only company set up to deal with farm waste, it's just one example of how industry is willing to deal with the mess its products create. Part of the success of any Kiwi business is also the attitude of employees toward their work. And while they're trying to make a difference for the good of the country, Ag Recovery's workers seem pretty motivated sorts. We've got some pretty good drivers, they don't tend to take sick days. You know, reasonably old school, so they'd... Uh, that they don't have many days off, which is good. <laughs> yeah, you know, they, they get in there and get the job done. Welcome back. Next up, I talk rural property sales with the Real Estate Institute's rural spokesman, Peter McDonald. Well, Peter, welcome to Tower Sector Report here on Country 99 TV. Good job. Now, let's begin with a, a, a broad brush look, if you like, at the state of play in terms of rural real estate. What's the level of turnover in farm sales if you look at it historically? John, it's been a pretty challenging time over the last two or three years. Is it? We're actually running at about a third of what we were doing back in about 2006, 2007. Really? Yeah, yeah. At that stage, I think we were consistently selling about 2,500 farms a year, mm. that's excluding lifestyles. Uh, at the moment I think we're running around about 700, might be 900 this month I think. Mm. So um, That's yeah. quite a significant that's drop off, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a huge drop. So what's driving it? Um, well there's been a lot of uncertainty out there of course John, mm. uh, as you understand, and uh, uh, the profitability mm. in farming is really good, mm. and the prices have been reasonably um, reasonably good, we, we, you'd expect them to be, mm. but there just hasn't been the availability of uh, finance to make these deals happen. There's, mm. there's, right through the whole the last two year period there's been a lot of interest. Mm. People have been out there wanting to buy, uh, people out there wanting to sell or needing to sell, but just the deals just didn't seem to get together. It just yeah. didn't seem to be enough uh, money coming through. 
Well, well, perhaps it's while we've got this commodities boom, and I don't think it's an exaggeration to talk about a boom at yeah. the moment, that's happening and, and yeah. incomes are, are pretty healthy. Um, but presumably the banks are reticent about lending because of the international um, yep. slowdown in, in the economy. The yeah, recession, the, if we Absolutely. The profitability for farming is as good as I think we've seen it. And yes. The prospects look really good. But, John, there's been a lot of people who got, got uh, hurt and shaken mm. up a wee bit over the last few years. Mm. Um, I mean, a year or two ago, they were encouraged to get out there and, and really spend. Yeah. I think one of the major banks had a, a slogan that said, um, capital's like a good working dog, just don't leave it tied up. <laughs> and you know, so people were encouraged to get yeah. out there and maximise their asset and borrow up to 65 and 70 yeah, percent. Yeah. And of course, we had the um, uh, a little bit of um, perhaps uh, say lack of confidence, but a moving away from uh, a keenness by the banks. Yeah. And of course, uh, the 60-30 or 60-40 ratio became the other way around. They wanted mm. uh, 60 percent equity and 40 percent perhaps borrowing. Mm. So, what's, what's not many farmers actually got into trouble. They were they were put under a lot of pressure. Yeah. And they really felt what it was like to owe some money, which mm. was quite a shame, mm. uh, because it, it really did undermine, undermine a lot of confidence out there. But I think it's, it's looking yeah. considerably better now. Yeah. What about prices? I mean, uh, with this boom going on, is that actually having a direct effect on, on the prices that are being paid for land? Well, the boom at the moment is only in payouts, of course, and profitability. Yeah. We, but we're doing pretty well in, in, like, wool has, yep. I think, doubled. Profit, um, but yeah, long returns. Last. That's what's yes, really the, going well. Yeah. Farm sales are still really quiet and land mm. prices are, haven't really moved much either. Mm. But that, that will follow on. I think there's a lot of people now realising, well, uh, they need to sort of consolidate, perhaps mm. retire a bit of debt, build yep. up a bit of equity in there. They've just felt how uncomfortable it is to be as vulnerable as they have been. Exactly, and they don't want to repeat no, that No, that's right. And yes. they're looking, they've seen a few, they've read a few where people have had to had to walk off their farms mm. and, you know, the, the crafer thing, that's been a, a mm. huge thing in everybody's mind. And um, you know, so I, I think everyone wants to try and avoid that situation, and mm. it's fair to say that some of them did have over those in those heady years, 2007, 2008, really did extend themselves mm. mortgage-wise. Now, if you just look across the different sectors, sheep, beef, um, uh, dairying, yeah. uh, how does horticulture fit in? It's really hard to get a handle on horticulture, John, it? because it's not like there's a heck of a lot of sales. No, and no. and horticulture can be so varied. Uh, there's all different types of horticulture. With dairy, you've got a common thread that goes across. We all produce That's milk true. solids. And with sheep and beef, we produce wool and whatever mm. it may be. But with horticulture, you've got um, such a market gardening and you've got your orcharding and you've got um, you know, yeah, other types of fruit and berries and stuff. So yeah. it's really hard to know. And, and of course, horticulture is quite isolated to various areas. If we look at the conversions from sheep and beef to, to dairy, does that tend to kind of skew the market a bit in terms of the values, of, you know, the... the the sums of money that are paid for this land? Uh, not really. People tend to look forward to uh, what a finished product's going to cost them, mm -hmm. uh, and they estimate what production's going to be. In, in saying that, though, there's not a great deal of conversions going on at the moment. Right. Uh, like a year or two ago, everything that was able to be converted was converted. Yeah. Uh, it's got to the stage now where really, you know, particularly when you've got some pretty attractive sheep and beef prices starting to come up, mm. and you've got some quite good uh, dairy grazing prices, there's some quite good grazing prices yeah. being paid out there now. So that land has a, a use and it has a good mm. return without it actually going into dairying now. Just getting away from farms yep. to small town New Zealand, um, little country towns, uh, how are prices holding in those small towns? Is there much turnover? Of of, are you talking residential, John? Residential, sorry. Yeah, yeah the little towns tend to, tend to run on their own dynamics to a certain yes, degree. Yeah. What happens in the big smoke really filters through at some stage, but they, mm. they rise and fall. A, a small town can be influenced by a, a, an industry closing or an industry opening mm. or something like that. But by and large, um, everyone's within the industry, the real estate industry, have found the last year or two pretty tough. Have they? Yeah. yeah. And uh, we're talking now of a, a wee bit of a um, resurgence in house prices. Auckland's looking really good. And that, mm. I guess, will eventually fil filter that, down. That filters through. Yeah. Um, Interest rates are really good, uh, very affordable, mm. and I think it's, it is a good time for people to get out there and buy. Mm. D is there a trend for people to try and escape from the big cities, but still pick a town that's close enough to a big centre so they can commute? Yeah, there, there always is that. I mean, it's, it's the Kiwi dream, isn't it? A few yes, acres. Exactly. Kids have a pony, raise mm. a calf or two. Mm. And, and, and getting onto that subject, the lifestyle market has mm. been the one really shining light in the industry. Right. Whilst we've had residential go up and down and we've had the fortunes of farming sort of going and, and sales back a third, mm. uh, by two thirds rather, um, 
the lifestyle market has stayed really steady. It probably fluctuates about four or five percent a month. Mm. And we're able to do a really good median search on those ones because there's oh, probably a thousand odd a month lifestyle blocks sold. Wow, really? So it's, that, yeah, that it is, is really good. It's a good market. Real Estate Institute Rural Spokesman Peter McDonald there. And that's our show for this week, but I'll be back very soon with another edition of Tower Sector Report. Remember, you can catch up with the program on our website. Catch you soon.